please rise for the playing of the national anthem.
Two, we wish this wasn't happening. Three, we're in the same boat. They have a mission today, trying to keep their top priority units in true fighting shape. They're in Chattanooga doing inspection work, work there that we hope will keep our Tier 1 units ready to go. As a former commander, I feel I must speak to you in this regard. 30 years ago next March, 30 years, March of 1966, I was inducted into the United States Army. I assure you that I did not volunteer. Due to an unusual set of circumstances, I was assigned to the 101st Airborne Division and in November of 1966 was sent to Vietnam where I served for one year. I became a very small part of a very elite and privileged military unit. I learned things there that enabled me to see, and survive, and function in unusual uh, situations and circumstances. After one year, I returned home and got out of the United States Army, feeling that I had the ultimate military experience and would never feel the pride and accomplishment of that year again. As so often has happened in my life, I was wrong about that particular statement. In 1972, I became a member of the 807, and for the next 14 years, watched that unit grow and improve. In 1986, I became the commander, a position in which I assure you I did not see. For the next five years and 10 months, I enjoyed the accomplishments, shared the camar camaraderie of a unique group of people. All individuals who have ever been a part of this unit and their families should swell with pride at the mention of the 807 and its history. In my study, I have a list of things that are very dear to me. In the middle of it is a framed, rather tattered lavender banner with the 807 on it. On the inscription it says to Colonel Brad Mutchler, in grateful appreciation for your leadership during peacetime and wartime. It is my proudest possession. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, the commander of the 807th Global Army Surgical Hospital, Colonel Lauren Gulfridge. I'm going to lighten this up just a little bit. And forgive me if I don't face uh, our guests as much as I do our unit. Because these words are basically for the unit. And General Barkin, you may want to not listen to some of this. Uh, 19 years ago, I left active duty and the, someone knocked on my door and uh, a few days later, as I was finally trying to set up practice in Sykes to Missouri in surgery, and it was the two-star general from Fort Leonard Wood who grew up in Charleston. And of course, I invited him in and he said, what reserve unit are you in? And I said, excuse me, sir? And he said, uh, what reserve unit are you in? And I said, well, I, I don't think I'm in any. He said, well, you have to be in the reserves. I'll take care of it. And I saw those two stars flash before me, and I said, yes, sir. Well, he called back the next day and said, you are in the 807th MASH in Paducah, Kentucky. And I saw the two stars flash again, and I said, yes, sir, again. Well, I called over there. I had severe doubts about getting in the reserves. And I talked to Colonel Bachman and some of the other people in the unit, and they said, sir, we just need your name. Now, you talk about a recruiting tool. I said, if you want to come to drill, come to drill. If you don't want to, that's fine. And so I showed up occasionally at drill. That's where I first met Brad. He had hair down to his shoulders. He had sideburns to the angle of the jaw. I can't remember if that was the gold chain era for him or not. I went to my first AT a short time later. It was kind of a broken up thing where each section went to their place. It was at Fort Sam Houston. Some of you in this room may remember. And I was a surgeon, I was the only surgeon. I showed up at the surgical clinic at Fort Sam. This colonel walked up to me, he said, what are you doing here? I said, I'm a reservist. He said, we don't need you. I said, okay, what should I do? He said, come in in the morning, have a cup of coffee, and do whatever you want. 
So I toured the Lone Star Brewery, I went to the River Walk, I went uh, to Corpus Christi. And about this time, I got to thinking, you know, the reserves isn't all bad. Our function at that time basically was patient care, we had parallel training, we had a minimum of field training, somewhere along the line. Wally Montgomery became the commander, I can't remember uh, what year his decade of command began exactly. And Colonel Much for Brad and I were more or less the only physicians that were in the unit most of the time. And we noticed, you know, over the years that Wally, yes, he'd lost his hair, and yes, he'd developed wrinkles, and yeah, he was irritable, and he was losing weight, but at 18 and so on, we were playing a lot of golf, and we got the exercise, and uh, we really had fun. Well, finally, after years and years of Wally's excellent uh, command, at Camp Grayling in 1983, a Colonel Whitehorse from the 83rd Archon out of Columbus, Ohio, showed up up there to talk to us. Well, we called him Colonel Whitehorse, and we thought that he was representing the 83rd Archon, who was commanded at that time by someone we called General Half-Track. And he discussed changing the command. Of course, Wally had discussed that with us individually and, and together. And Brad and I shook our heads, we talked, and uh, then we got up and left. The Colonel Whitehorse was still sitting there, and First Sergeant Preston was there with him, and he said, well, where, where did they go? And Preston said, well, I guess they went down to the lake to flip a coin and see who the next commander's going to be. And I lost that coin flip. All the time we were having fun, the work was being done. Supply, administration, motor pool, everything became more and more efficient. And most efficient, we were good at taking care of patients. When people heard that the 807th MASH was going to be supporting their National Guard units or their reserve units, they were happy. Why? Because we pitched in and did our job. And I laugh about us playing golf and having fun, which Brad and I did, but when patients were there, we worked very, very hard. Brad became the commander. Emphasis uh, eventually changed from parallel training and mission support to field training and soldier skills. The Persian Gulf War came along. And I, again, I just want to bring back that memory of how important this unit was during that war. It was critical to each and every one of you who knew someone who went or, or who actually went yourself. I can venture that you remember to the exact minute when you got the phone call. I was in Corning, Arkansas. I was duck hunting with a dentist friend of mine from Ohio. And it was 2.30 in the morning on a Saturday. And the phone rang. And I said, Brad, how in the hell did you ever find me? And he laughed and he said, well, we, we have our ways. And I hung up the phone after he told me when we had to report. There was silence in the room, and my friend from Ohio, finally from the silence of his bed, he said, that was the call, wasn't it? I said, yeah, it was. And there was silence again. He said, well, we can still hunt ducks tomorrow, can't we? <laughs> <laughs> well, what is it that makes this unit so special? You know, I don't know. It's the area, it's Paducah itself, which has supported this place and this unit beyond all comprehension. It's southern Illinois, it's southern Indiana, it's western Tennessee, western Kentucky, eastern Missouri. It's a bunch of people put together from all walks of life who have a dedication to their country and to the freedom which we all enjoy. I asked you two years ago to do things for me. 
We did everything I asked. This is a very sad day, but it's also a day with honor. We can walk away from the 807th MASH always knowing that we did our mission. I'm so proud to have been part of this and to have been your commander. And thank you for letting me address you today. God bless you. Restore to serve.